I got a replacement for Sam. Here he is. Actually, that skunk was sent to me by Buddy Davis from Answers in Genesis. He knew that I wanted one and kindly sent it as a gift. And by the way, thank you for all the cards that were sent after the passing of Sam. The pictures, the bouquet of flowers, the blanket, and the little sunglasses for the new puppy when she's big enough to go on the bike. Four months ago, a friend sent me a video of his Aussie doodle. It reminded me of the dog on Fraggle Rock, so I decided to get one. And right now we're waiting for that puppy to come from the airport and I can't tell you how excited I am. Her name's Lucy, she's an Aussie doodle, which means she's part poodle and part Australian shepherd, which means she's got a propensity or an instinct to round up sheep. Lucy is too small for the platform that Sam used to sit on. I'm making this platform here and it's going to fit right where Sam used to sit, over here. That was your maiden voyage. How was that, Lucy? And Sam's glasses. Maybe one day. One of the best things I ever did to make contact with strangers was to put sunglasses on my dog. There's something disarming about someone who has a dog that wears sunglasses. This young man's name was Daniel. He approached me and said, hey, I like your dog, and from there I was able to share the gospel with him. Same with these guys. And these guys. any evidence for God? No. What's your thoughts on the afterlife? The aspect of heaven and hell that sounds like a fairy tale. Do you think there's any evidence for God? No. What about everything around you that's made? Could you make a tree or a flower or a bird or a puppy or a kitten? No. Could no, anybody you... do that? No, you can't. You so can't. there has to be an initial cause, someone intelligent to create all those things. Indeed. Did you hear that? A complete turnaround. Someone who said there's no evidence for God's existence suddenly acknowledging his existence. Why? Because God has given light to every man. The work of the law is written upon his heart. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by things that are made. So it's evident that I'm dealing with a reasonable person. So what do you think God requires of you, Jack? Just do my best. Jesus was asked, What's the first and greatest commandment? He said this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your strength. And then he said, And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Someone says, What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Jesus said this man was minding his own business when thieves fell upon him and beat him. A religious man walked past, didn't help him. And this Samaritan bathed his wounds, poured in oil and wine, picked him up, put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn or a hotel, and he said to the hotel manager, if this man spends any money while I'm away, let me know and I'll pay it all back. That's what it means to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And none of us can reach that, but we should love God. He gave you your eyes. 
Everything you see is because God gave your eyes, He gave your brain to think, food to eat. He gave you a wonderful family, blue sky, the morning sunrise, and we don't love Him with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you know why? No. Because we're rebels, every single one of us. Now, do you think you're a good person, Jack? I believe so. How many lies have you told? That's the ninth commandment. Probably enough. Have you ever stolen something? It's value. Kid, yeah. I'm when you're a kid. So you started young. What do you call someone who steals? A thief. So what are you? Not a thief. <laughs> I grew out of that. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yeah. Okay. Do you love your mum? Yeah. Would you ever use her name as a cuss word? I don't think so. Of course you wouldn't. That'd be disrespectful. Instead of saying SH, to use her name to express disgust. It'd be a horrible insult, and yet you've taken the name of the God, the holy name of God, the God who gave you life and gave you a mother and used it in place of the S word to express disgust. Jack, that's called blasphemy, so serious in God's eyes. In the Old Testament, it was punishable by death. So hang in there, one to go. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yeah. You had sex outside of marriage. So here's the summation. This is how you're going to do on Judgment Day. I'm not judging you, but you've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, self-righteous, adulterer at heart. If God judges you by those ten commandments on Judgment Day, and we've looked at four, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Probably guilty. Heaven or hell? Probably hell. Do you know how you can be saved from death and hell? Repent. That won't help you. That's like saying to a judge, Judge, I committed the crime, but I won't do it again. I'm really sorry. He's going to say, good, you should be sorry. You're going to jail. So repentance, which is saying you won't do it again and you're really sorry, can't save you on man's court, and it's certainly not going to save you on Judgment Day. You need something else to save you from hell. Do you know what it is? No. You probably do, but you don't understand it. Because you don't understand it, you don't value it. You need God's mercy, and God's mercy was exemplified through the cross. You've heard of Jesus dying on the cross? We broke God's law, the Ten Commandments, and Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on the cross. That's why he said, it is finished, just before he died. He was saying, paid in full. We broke the law, he paid the fine. Like, like a judge looks at a criminal and says, there's a stack of speeding fines here, but someone's paid him. You can go. Even though you're guilty, he lets you walk because someone paid your fine. And Jack, even though you and I are guilty of a multitude of crimes, we haven't even, we haven't even looked at your secret sins that God has seen. Even though we're all guilty of a multitude of crimes, God can let us live forever. He can take the death sentence off us because Jesus paid the fine in full on that cross and then he rose from the dead and defeated death. And all you have to do to find everlasting life for you and for your children is repent of those sins. That won't save you, but that's on the way to getting saved. You repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. It's like you can turn to a parachute. That turning won't save you, but trusting in the parachute will. When you jump, it'll save you. And when you pass through death, if you're trusting in Jesus, the Savior, all your sins are washed away. And when you stand before God on Judgment Day, you're clean. Because your sins have been washed away and you've been given what's called the righteousness of God in Christ. Is this making sense? Yeah. You're going to think about what we talked about? Definitely. Jack, you're, are you married or are you living with a lady? Mm, not married. And you got kids? Yeah. What are you going to say to your kids when they say, Daddy, why am I going to die? If you've got no explanation or answer for them, you're going to leave them in death. So, man, you've got to think about your family, not just yourself. So if you get right with God, you let go of those sins and say, God, forgive me, I've sinned against you. Please create in me a clean heart. If you get saved, then you'll come out of darkness into light. You'll find everlasting life and you'll lead your family in that, into that light too. You hear what I'm saying? I hear you. So when are you going to repent and trust in Christ? Today. You serious? Serious. Okay. Can I pray with you? Sure. Father, I pray for Jack. Thank you for his open heart today. Thank you for leading me here today to speak to him. And I pray that he will think about his secret sins. Think about what you did on the cross and find a place of true repentance, true sorrow for sin. And this day be born again with a new heart and new desires. All because of your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you have a Bible at home? Yeah. Can I give you a Gospel of John? Sure. You know what a Gospel of John is? Fourth book of the New Testament. So, so do you think you'll read it? Indeed I will. I will take some time out. Okay. You've made my day, Jack. It's great to meet you. Same here. Well, hi, I'm Ken Ham, CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter. 
On May 6, 2023, a glamorous event will occur in London, England, the coronation of the King. You know, it's been 70 years since we've seen the coronation for a British monarch. And so the world is going to be watching. People are going to flock to London. And that's why Answers in Genesis USA and Answers in Genesis UK are partnering with our friends at Living Waters for what we call Operation London. Now this is a unique event where we have the opportunity to be able to reach an enormous number of people with the message of the saving gospel. And so I'm going to let my friend Ray Comfort give you all the details, but imagine being able to be in London and hand out thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of these special tracks which Living Waters has produced and they're powerful. So Ray, why don't you give them all the details? This is the British Royal Coat of Arms and that crown on the lion's head is symbolic of the dominion of King Charles III, especially as defender of the faith. And on May the 6th, he'll publicly make an oath before God to defend the Church of England. That's what defender of the faith means. This will be done in England's most famous church, witnessed by hundreds of millions from around the world. In other words, the world is going to church, where they'll join in a service about Jesus, God, and the Bible. King Charles will lay his right hand on the Bible and swear before God to uphold the scriptures. He'll hold the royal scepter as Solomon held the royal scepter. And when he's crowned, as was Solomon, all the people will cry, God save the king. And then he'll be anointed with oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And all this will be done in the name of Jesus. And the secular media will be forced to explain the symbolism. This is a massive and unprecedented opportunity to reach millions with the gospel. And the media is not going to ignore the service because they know of this world's insatiable appetite for anything royal. And this coronation is the crowning glory of them all. Those who come to London will see this gospel track as irresistible memorabilia. And because of the nature of the church service, it naturally flows into the gospel. It is with all this in mind that we're inviting Christians from around the world to go to London. If you're interested in attending this outreach, go to livingwaters.com forward slash London for more information. Again, the world is not only going to love these, they're going to treasure them. We have had over three million printed. All we need is thousands of laborers to come to London for a day. Will you come? If you can't, show this video at your church, take up a collection and sponsor a team. Don't let this pass you by. If you live down under, join the team that's coming from Australia. We're sending our television crew from California so you can be part of an Operation London television special. Teams from Living Waters Europe and Answers in Genesis will be there. Become a point person in your city. Share this vision with pastors and youth leaders. Then bring a busload to London. You've wanted to do something great for the kingdom of God, and this is your chance. This can be as big as we make it. If you know of good churches, evangelistic ministries, or key people in Europe who care about the lost, send them the link to this video. Just one text or email sent to the right person could change the eternal destiny of multitudes. And please pray for Operation London. For details of how you can be involved, go to livingwaters.com forward slash London.